All right, everybody. Hello and good evening. Welcome to the official NCAE channels for this edition in March of our Tuesdays with Tamika. My name is Tamika Walker Kelly, your favorite music teacher and president of the North Carolina Association of Educators in CAE. And like I said, this is the March edition of Tuesdays with Tamika. You know, we have transitioned to a monthly format to give you all of the news and updates around public education happening in our state. Now, I am really excited. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my special guest for today. We're going to go ahead and add her. Uh, say hello, everybody, to Representative Julie Von Hafen, who represents House District 36 in the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, so you can say hello to everybody, <laughs> Representative Von Hafen. Hello, NCAE members and supporters. Really happy to be with you today. Thank you uh, so much for being here with us. So Representative Von Hafen heads up a lot of education related work in the house. And so we asked her to be here today to share with us what is going on in the General Assembly. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule as one of our elected representatives to be here with us today. And so we're going to go through a series of questions today just to get to know uh, Representative Von Hafen and find out what's happening, like I said, in the General Assembly. So, Julie, I have heard you say before that you don't really think of yourself as a politician. You think of yourself as a mom like me who happens to be a representative. So why do you think it's important to make that distinction to the public, to the people? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me, Tamika. I mean, really, I, I I do not consider myself a politician. I really don't like the political side of my job. I, I really like the service part of my job. And I think that, you know, that just goes back to, to what I really have done my whole career. I mean, I was a lawyer and I always did things I felt like in service to my clients. And then when I when I left my legal career, um, my 10 plus years in public school advocacy with PTA, you know, as a PTA volunteer, uh, you do not get paid. <laughs> and so you do it out of the goodness of your of your own heart and for the passion that you have for the work that you're doing. And honestly, I just feel like I, I brought that to my job at the General Assembly that I'm really there in service of, you know, my community, of, of my, um, my district. And, you know, I'm just there to advocate for kind of the same things that I did on the other side of the desk, so to speak. And so um, I just want people to realize that people that serve in public office are people just like you. Um, I'm a mom of three kids in Wake County Public Schools. You know, I don't have a huge background in politics and it's not something that, you know, I'm really, um, have a lot of experience in, but I do have experience in working for things that I care about. And so um, I just want people to always feel free to, you know, I want to be approachable and somebody that they can come talk to about things that are important to them, because that's what I used to do when I was an advocate with PTA. Well, thank you for sharing your journey, because a lot of people do forget that our elected representatives are just like us. They put on their pants the same way we do, one leg at a time. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, it encourages people from all different perspectives and different walks of life to be involved in the political process because it affects us all. So I, I appreciate you sharing that journey with us. Um, and you mentioned and touched on your role as a mother, and we know that you care about public education. Like you say, your own children are uh, students in the Wake County public school system. And so because of that, you've been a part of a lot of education related bills over the past few years. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you here today is because you have done a lot of work around crafting legislation as it relates to the long running Leandro case. Uh, so can you help our uh, viewing public understand a little bit about Leandro and why it is so important for public education in North Carolina? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to pull up my notes because Leandro is very, you know, complicated thing. And I know that that word gets tossed around a lot. And so if you're if you're not super familiar with the history of it, I'll just give kind of a, a brief outline and the fact that 
the case has been going on for, I think, close to 25 years now. Um, back in 1997, um, the court determined that children in low income, low income communities in North Carolina were not being afforded their same constitutionally guaranteed um, right to a sound basic education. Um, and that is what it states in our North Carolina constitution. So basically after that, um, there's been lots of going back and forth with the court about, okay, what are we gonna do about that, right? And so really, it's it's really come down to at this point now, um, last year, I believe, time is weird, but I think it was last year <laughs> that the West Ed report came out, which you might've also heard about, which is basically the court ordered an outside organization to assess how can we address you know this this failure of our state to provide our children with this their constitutional right to a sound basic education so they came out with a very detailed report including lots of numbers and lots of policy changes that we would need to do and so what we started doing last year um, after that west ed report came out is to think about okay what legislation are we going to need to pass in order to put those uh, recommendations into practice or into law? And so that's kind of where we stand right now. I mean, unfortunately, things have not progressed. I think the COVID, you know, obviously put a lot of um, put this on the back burner, unfortunately. But as we know, the pandemic has really, you know, shown a light on a lot of the things that Leandro has actually been talking about for the last 25 to 30 years, you know, these inequities that we have across our state. And so in my eyes, Leandro is even more important than ever, you know, after the pandemic, because we're really seeing, you know, the effects of, of these long term uh, problems with funding and policy decisions that um, our General Assembly has been making, um, you know, for a long, long time. And so um, just to up to right now, actually, yesterday, there was a another report that was due to the court that was supposed to be basically the defendants submitting um, an eight year plan to implement Leandro that was due yesterday. I have not seen it yet. I've been busy doing other things, but I'm not sure uh, if that was submitted or not. Uh, the last time I talked to the governor's office, they were supposed to be submitting it yesterday. And then the other thing that's kind of happening right now is that the governor is developing his budget proposals for the General Assembly. He's required to submit a budget every year. And so he's actually and his staff are writing that as we speak. And so I know that Every Child NC, which is a great uh, advocacy organization that's working to um, you know, get the word about, about Leandro and to advocate around Leandro, they are pushing for the governor to um, include the entire funding of Leandro in his budget. So we're kind of all waiting with bated breath to see if the governor will do that. I have also personally encouraged his staff to do that. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that that will happen. So that's kind of where it stands right now. And I, I, I'll update if we can continue talking about some of the legislation that we filed last year and then that we were probably be, that we will be filing this year. Well, thank you for that uh, helpful breakdown of Leandro for somebody watching who didn't know what it was. And you're right, it has been a case that has lasted 20 plus years um, for this, our government, our General Assembly to provide what, what it says in the Constitution, a constitutionally mandated sound basic education uh, for students. And also just want to shout out again, our coalition partners at Every Child NC who are doing great work around Leandro, um, hashtag lead with Leandro, uh, because one of our uh, priorities as an organization along with Every Child NC, right, is to see the implementation of the Leandro recommendations from the West End Report, because it's like you said, COVID-19 has exposed the inequities that have faced public education for a long time. So this is not new that we are seeing disparities um, in resources and funding um, for our students. And so we really want and we know that they should be addressed in whatever budget comes out of the General Assembly, uh, but not only just in this budget, but a long term investment in public education. So thank you for breaking that down. 
for our viewers. And uh, the recommendations, as you said, draw a clear roadmap of where the General Assembly should go to fulfill those constitutional requirements. Um, and so you were uh, part of a part of drafting the bill in the last session that addressed some of these issues. So can you talk a little bit about the bill that y'all worked on in the last session? Yeah, so last session, uh, in the short session in 2020, we filed two bills addressing Leandro. One was House Bill 1129, and the other one was 1130. So 1129 um, addressed the policy changes that we would need to make um, in North Carolina to, to fulfill this constitutional obligation. And I'll just run down a, qu a couple quick highlights. I'm not going to go through every bit of the bill, but just to give an example of some things that we would need to do in order to fulfill Leandro is, is for example, first we would need to eliminate uh, the antiquated school A through F grading system, which really unfairly, you know, uh, punishes low income schools. As we know, there's a direct correlation between a school grade and, and how many low income students attend that school. So we need to eliminate that. The second one would be to allowing teacher salary increases that are commensurate with performance and experience in order to keep the best teachers in our classrooms. We would need to set an ambitious five-year goal of reducing the number of uncertified teachers and leaders in high poverty schools and limiting the number of teachers and leaders with less than three years of experience in those schools. So I think really what we're seeing is in some of those high poverty schools, we're seeing unexperienced, you know, maybe uncertified teachers, and we need to get the best teachers, you know, into those schools and make a real effort toward more equity in our teaching professionals across our state. Um, we need to rebuild um, our state's capacity to provide assistance to some of those low performing schools by providing by providing additional funding and flexibility to those schools to make sure that they have what they need to make sure that they're increasing in their performance. And also we have to increase our teacher to diversity um, across our state. And that includes setting benchmarks for recruitment and retention of teachers of color. Um, we, we, there's been great studies and, you know, that have been going on the last couple of years about how important um, racial diversity is, you know, in our for our students and that not just students of color, for all students, because, you know, white students need to see teachers of color in their classrooms as well. It's so important. So those are just some highlights of that. Um, I can answer more questions and I have more details, but then I'll go on to the House Bill 1130, which was the funding bill that we filed. And that one really is what's allocating the money to put these things in, into place. And so like, for example, the first one would be to allocate money to make sure um, that we're retraining and retaining the best teachers in North Carolina through an expanded early childhood pipeline and teaching fellows program. I know that's really important to teachers out there. Um, making significant investments in pre-K, infant, toddler, and smart start programs. Um, increasing supplemental funding for our special needs students and making sure that all those students have what they need to succeed, increasing the supplemental funding for low income schools. Um, and like I mentioned before, providing additional funding for educator professional development, funding our teacher assistance again to make sure that we're supporting early literacy. And then of course, investing more in broadband, which when we filed this bill before the pandemic, of course, we we were already worried about that. And as we, you know, have, as we've seen, that's really uh, the chickens have come home to roost on that with the pandemic, and just making sure that we have universal broadband access, you know, within the next few years. So those are some high level highlights um, of you know really what we need to do to make sure that we're funding Leandro. And just to give you a, a rough idea of you know what we appropriated in 1130. We uh, appropriated almost $140 million um, just for two years to do those things. And honestly, Tamika, we have the money to do it. I'm sure that you all have seen that we have a large amount of money sitting in our savings account, so to speak. Almost $5 billion is sitting there. So when you think about 140 million, you know, it's it's not that much, right? And so we can make a significant dent in working toward the goals of Leandra if we really prioritized it and made it something that we we really wanted to do. Yes, and thank you for sharing, you know, those specific pieces, right? So it's not only 
just the policy piece, but it is the funding piece as well, because, you know, we say that your budget reflects your priorities and we need to make sure that we include uh, those specific pieces in the budget because we want them to be sustainable. Right. And we want these things also to be on re reoccurring funds. We do not want them to be on non reoccurring funds because we know that's a limited uh, time constraint sort of funding base. And so I, I appreciate you for breaking that down. And in the chat, if you are looking to our viewers, you will see links uh, to those bills so that you can look at them, right? And also so that you can contact your state representative to work with Representative Von Hafen and making sure we get those things moving again and that they get traction and that they get votes in support because it's really important. Now, I a just, couple of things. Oh, go ahead. Can I just add procedurally? So those bills are dead now because they were filed last session. Um, so we are going to be refiling them and we're actually in the process of writing them right now. So I will be sure to get back with you guys about when those bills are filed so that you can start calling and emailing and, and getting a hold of your members to make sure that they support them. So, but you can also start now by just encouraging people to, you know, start looking for them and start, you know, and, and reach out to me if they're interested in co-sponsoring, you know, those kind of things. So they're, they're in, being written now. So there's nothing filed yet. I just want to make sure everyone understood that. Yeah, so do want to let people know you can call your state rep and ask them if they want to co-sponsor this bill <laughs> or draft the bill in companion uh, with Representative Von Hafen because, like I said, this is the time where laws and things get made and policies get made. So you can they can definitely work with her uh, because she is very well versed on this particular topic. Um, and I also just wanted to note um, how important it is right, that you mentioned our early childhood experiences and our pre-K educators, because a lot of times they get left out of the conversation around education, but we all know a strong foundation in those early years sets up our students uh, for success as they move through K-12 education. So just wanted to thank you for, for reiterating those points and shout out to our pre-K and early career educators as well. Um, so, uh, that, of course, is a lot, right? But it's important. And there's still quite a bit of work left to do. Um, what do you think, um, what else is necessary in order to continue to push for support around the Leandro recommendations? Yeah, I mentioned, you know, and the coalition, I think the NCA is part of called Every Child NC. And I encourage you all, if you're if you're interested in learning more about Leandro, they have some fantastic resources. They have many, many ways to get involved um, with, you know, advocacy on this issue. It's a coalition of, I believe they have about 30 or 40 groups now that are part of this coalition, you know, um, a variety of different, you know, from, from teaching organizations, educational organizations, parent organizations, business organizations, because we know that, you know, a strong public education system is good for our economy. And we have to really, we have sometimes have to, you know, take that talking point in order to, order to appeal to, to all types of people on both sides of the aisle. Um, if we can't appeal to the fact that, you know, we have to support our kids and our teachers and, and give them a strong foundation, we can talk about the fact that if we don't have a strong education system, you know, corporations and businesses aren't going to want to come to North Carolina. They're not going to want to move their families here. They're not going to, you know, want to invest in our state. And so we have to think about how to talk about these issues. And so I encourage you to, to get involved with Every Child NC and and, and, and learn more. The North Carolina Justice Center also does some great work around this, um, this topic, and they're one of the partners in Every Child NC, and so they have some great webinars and different things that you can learn more about. But just I just encourage you to learn more about Leandra if you don't know a lot about it. There's lots of different things online. Also, the Public School Forum of North Carolina did a great um, summary of the Leandro, uh, bill, uh, the Leandro case um, and their education issues this year. Year. And so there's so many groups that you can get involved with to, to talk about it. If you if you want to learn more, or you you know, you have questions, I'm always available. I would love to talk to you about it. Um, you can reach my uh, email, my phone number on the North Carolina General Assembly website, and I'd be more than happy to, to talk to you as well. 
that's awesome. And I will also just note uh, that she is very responsive on her Facebook constituent page. So please check it out. And she always shares a wealth of information about what's going on behind the scenes um, with the General Assembly and just keeping people updated on all kinds of things that are happening in Wake County as well. So just wanted to point that out there. Yeah. Um, so wanted to also let people know that if you watch this space, we will be doing a special uh, series of Tuesdays with Tamika to uh, it to educate you about the Lee Andrew uh, case and the West End report as well. So just keep your eye on this space and announcements on our NCAE Facebook page so that you can learn more about Lee Andrew and how you can get involved to make it a reality, uh, the recommendations so that every child has a high quality uh, public education, not just sound basic, that's the bare minimum. That's what we want to get to. But we want every child to have a high quality public education, regardless of their zip code. Um, so, Representative Von Hafen, I want to thank you so much for your time here today. And I also want to thank you so much for your hard work in fighting for public education, because you do so much for our students and our parents and our educators here in North Carolina. So thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Tamika. And I just I wanted to also um, give a shout out that if you guys um, don't get like a regular update on the on the General Assembly, I do a newsletter twice a month that I think is a really good insight. So please, again, feel free to email me and I'd love to put you on my newsletter list. Um, you don't have to live in my district or Wake County or anything, and you can get that uh, by email. So just stay engaged, stay involved. And, um, you know, we need you guys uh, fighting for kids uh, all over the state. So thanks again for all you do too, Tamika and, and NCAE. Well, thank you. Well, friends, uh, we are out of time for today. Like I said, I want to thank Representative Julie Von Hafen and thank you all as well for tuning in because it's Tuesday night and you could be doing anything else, but you are here with us. So thank you so much. Please keep an eye out for that Leandro series and additional upcoming episodes of Tuesday with Tamika. I hope that your March is off to a great start and we will see each other soon. Soon. Also, just a plug, check out the We Heart Public Schools a tour and website so, so you'll know if we are coming to your county, uh, how you get connected to all of the different events that we are having with the We Heart Public Schools tour. All right. So have a great evening and we will see you soon. Bye, y'all.